which we will post later on our YouTube page. So again, welcome. Uh, I'm Danielle and I'm the community coordinator at Mental Health America. Let's get going into our training. So when we think about managing complex emotions in a complex world, right? Um, we've had a lot to think about these days with the pandemic, especially in this last year. And many of us have seen increased stress and increased anxiety. So what we're hoping to do today is to give you some tools to better manage this and uh, you know, basic self-care tools and then some coping skills when things get a little more intense. So I have two screens going here for me. I'm looking at you in the camera. Occasionally I'll be turning to the right like this so I can read some of the, the, uh, the, the screens that are up here, but some of them I can see just in front of me. It's just an interesting two screen session. So the objectives today are to describe the negative impact of COVID-19 on our mental health. We're gonna discuss the physiological and the psychological effects of stress and anxiety. We're gonna identify self-care and coping skills, which will address anxiety. And then we're gonna give you some resources at the end. And uh, we're gonna have those available to you also. Our updated resources will be emailed to you as well as a copy of this training. So you'll be able to have both. The one thing with COVID-19, and I like to say this, is the one thing that we can be sure of since this pandemic has started is that we can't be sure of anything. No one that I knew, uh, except for maybe someone who is maybe just born in 1920 or 21 during the last pandemic, uh, really knew how to handle anything in this situation. Even those of us in mental health, you know, none of us were sure what had happened. Uh, we didn't know how we should or how we're supposed to feel or what we're supposed to feel. But just to let you know, whatever that is on any given day, it's okay to feel exactly how you feel. There should be nothing wrong with that. So COVID-19 has resulted in an increase in reports of anxiety and depressive symptoms. I'd like to give you a little information on a snapshot that we took of the pandemic back in the end of June of last year, and we get reports from the CDC all the time. And one of the things that I noticed as I went through there and read it, they compared the end of June 2020 to the end of June in 2019. And what we saw was that there was a significant raise in stress and anxiety, almost doubled from what it was over a year ago. And as I looked more into the report, I found that the highest levels of stress and anxiety were showing up in essential workers. Those of us who work uh, you know, in mental health or those of us who had had jobs continuing through the pandemic, very close related to that were those who had lost jobs and, and things of that nature been laid off. Now, COVID-19 has resulted in an increase in experience of severity of symptoms from those with pre-existing mental health conditions. This is pretty common. If someone who has a mental health condition is experiencing a trauma, and this is like a community trauma, something, maybe another idea of a community trauma might be a hurricane that affects us all on the island. Anyone who is not doing so well beforehand or anyone who has a pre-existing mental health condition are often hit much harder. Some of the statistics that I want to give you the next two ones are just a little bit of framework, uh, what we've been looking at in the state of Hawaii, maybe over the last uh, five years or so. 3.7% of Hawaii residents live with a serious mental health condition. 3.5%, but only out of that amount, 68% did not receive treatment, which means only 32% actually received treatment. So let me ask you, think about this. What is the median time? What is the time from when somebody recognizes that they have a mental health condition between that point and when they get help. What do you think the average amount of time is from when someone recognizes they have a mental health condition to when they reach out for help? And you can just pop this in the chat. You can just pop this, okay? Carolyn, six years, okay? Years, just Jennifer, yeah, all right. Anyone else wanna make a guess? We have six years, we have years. Um, four months, okay, well, basically, 
it's 10 years. From the time that you actually realize that you have a mental health condition to the time you get help. So we're just, you know, one of the messages I always like to give in any training that I do for mental health is a mirror that asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness, right? Reach out and get help whenever you can. If you feel that something is going on, reach out and get help, right? If you broke your arm, you wouldn't try to fix it yourself, right? You go to a doctor. The same thing here. The last one, uh, part of this slide is I want to say is that every one other day, somebody in Hawaii dies by suicide. And again, we're just giving you a little bit of landscape of where we are at when the pandemic started and where we're still at now. So this is from the Department of Health uh, Injury Prevention and Control System. And uh, we're gonna show you a couple graphs in the next couple slides just to further you know, lay down the landscape. So if you look at this, it's rated one through five on the left across the top is by years. And these are causes of fatal injury death in the state of Hawaii from 2015 to 2019. As you can see, suicide is number one in the two boxes, 15 to 29 and 30 to 44. This means suicide being the leading cause of injury death is the total on the far right top hand corner. This is more than car accidents, suffocations, drownings, poisonings, motor vehicle accidents, homicides. Now, what's not taking into uh, consideration here, anyone who dies, is from, dies from like heart disease or cancer or something like that. This is strictly fatal injuries by accidental death. Um, Hawaii, or, uh, suicide is, is in that category. So one person dies every two days in the state of Hawaii of, by suicide. But whenever I look at a, a, a graph like this, I like to provide some kind of hope. So I want you to think back, uh, maybe when you were growing up, and I know I have lived a while, so back in the days when I first learned how to drive, there were seatbelts in the cars, but nobody used them, right? Actually, back then, motor vehicle accidents was the leading cause of injury death pretty much across the nation. But so many campaigns were run, buckle up for safety, click it or ticket right? Uh, we had car seats for kids starting to come in to play in the, in the 80s and 90s. We also had Mothers Against Drunk Driving. There was a lot of public awareness on this. The more public awareness that we can bring to suicide, the more we can talk about this and keep it in our conversation um, can help with prevention because we've seen that this has helped work for this. So we're hoping that all the work that we're doing at Mental Health America of Hawaii and the state uh, uh, task forces on, on suicide prevention, that hopefully this will be accomplished in the future. Okay, laying a little more groundwork here. This is a uh, graph of uh, mental health, risk to mental health. So I like to think about this sometimes as, as hidden risk to mental health, because sometimes people don't always associate these risks. This was actually presented by the World Health Organization um, and put together, if we look at the top of it, it's just a schematic view of your mental health over the course of a life. So if you look on the bottom of the graph in red, you'll see the different areas of life that you will go through, starting from early childhood, then to adolescence, adulthood, and older adulthood. Down the left-hand side of the settings that we are all experiencing, sometimes within our culture, community, or family, or you're as an individual. And then across the top, we have the different setting, home, family, school, media, work, community, home. So we'll just take one example and we'll go through it. And so let's remember back to when we were kids. Let's look at school. All right, so, so as we move down from the top, we see the culture wise, maybe there was an adverse learning experience or environment. Maybe you went to a school where there was a lot of bullying in your community. Maybe you found difficulties when you were in school. Maybe there wasn't enough schools or enough choices of places to go to school. With your family, you might've experienced trauma or maltreatment. Maybe you grew up in a home, God forbid, where there was uh, substance use or there was maybe domestic violence um, or just individual. Maybe you didn't get enough good nutrition. Maybe you suffered from low self-esteem or physical health. Physical health affects your mental health. It's all connected. And you're gonna see here as we go through this training on how that connects to added stress and anxiety. But thinking back on this, these are risks to your mental health all the way through your life. Okay, 
I want to make sure I didn't skip a slide there. I think I did. Thank you for your patience. So vulnerable populations, all right? When COVID-19 hit, these are the most vulnerable populations. Individuals who were at the high at risk for COVID-19, very, very vulnerable for their physical health and for their mental health. Individuals with pre-existing medical conditions, psychiatric or substance use challenges. Healthcare providers, they were on the front lines. They continue to be on the front lines as we still go through this pandemic. Um, certain age groups, keiki, teens, kapunas, caregivers. Think about the keiki. They went on uh, spring vacation last year and they never actually got back in school, although some have gone to blended learners. But I also want you to think about the caregivers. Think about them. Maybe the caregiver was at home in a multi-generational home taking care of, uh, of you know, uh, uh, Papa or Tutu and maybe taking care of them for uh, on a daily basis. But all of a sudden now they have the kids and they have everyone else and who's really giving them time? Who's taking care of them? So they're almost twice as vulnerable as those that they're that they are taking care of. Other ones that have a vulnerable populations that we know of usually in just in average times too are individuals with employment status changes. A lot of people were laid off, right? A lot of people didn't know what to do, couldn't get help. Um, our system for unemployment failed a lot of people. Uh, marginalized groups uh, such as our, um, you know, the South Pacific Islanders, the many groups in our island of that nature, maybe LGBTQ. Uh, groups as well, and then individuals experience houselessness, right? These are all vulnerable populations that were basically impacted as we were as an average person, but even more so because they were part of the vulnerable populations. So what I want to do right now is I want to just dive into this a little bit. Let's take a look at anxiety, all right? When we're anxious, we have physiological symptoms and we have psychological symptoms, all right? They are connected. You might not think so, but they are. Some of the physiological symptoms that we have, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, chest pains, muscle tension, uh, dizziness, stomach pains. I know a lot of times with our youth, right? Sometimes when you talk to your child, they're not exactly sure what's the cause of their pain. And sometimes I just say, you know, mommy, my, my stomach hurts. I'm not sure what's wrong. You take their temperature and everything. They're probably feeling anxious. They're probably having anxiety. And actually for youth, anxiety is the, um, is the leading uh, mental health condition that they face. But what else do you, what else, if you just saw these symptoms in somebody, what else would you think was happening if you just happened to come by someone and you saw these symptoms? And you can pop that in the chat. If you recognize these symptoms in someone, what else do you think might be going on with them? Any guesses? Heart attack. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Yeah, depression. Yeah, could be, could be, right? Heart attack is the basic answer because those are very, very similar symptoms. But there are also some of those are symptoms too that are associated with depression. Thank you for uh, chiming in. So think about the psychological symptoms. All right. So when you get into excessive worry, when something happens right away uh, that causes excessive worry, uh, your brain actually sends a, a stressor message down through your body. So let's take this back a little bit in historically. So let's say you're a prehistoric man or woman out and you're hunting and you're out hunting and you see a saber-toothed tiger and it comes up upon you and you guys eye each other. What's happening when you get that excessive worry, you're either gonna to revert to flight, fight, or freeze. This is what happens. So our ancestor, what did they decide to do? They see that saber-toothed tiger eyeing him for some lunch, they're gonna go and they run. So they take off and run. When that happens, right? What happens with our body is our brain has sent that stressor and you are now running and they're working together to pull the blood flow back from your rest of your body to your heart and to your brain because these are your most protective organs that you need to protect. It's pulling the blood flow back 
to try and help you. And when that does, your immune system is also lowered. When that blood flow goes back to these essential organs to protect you, now your legs and your arms are very light and you can run fast and get away. So what happens is when that situation is over, when you're safely away from that tiger, our ancestor sits down and you know catches his breath and everything in his system starts to revert back to normal, right? The brain sets the stressor go back and says, yeah, my body's returning to normal. But what I want you to do is I want you to compare this with the pandemic, all right? A lot of us who maybe had worked, continued working as excessive work, as um, essential workers, we're trying to help people on a daily basis. So we're constantly worried that we're not giving them enough help or we're getting agitated because we don't feel like we're doing enough. We're becoming restless, right? We have attention problems or concentration. We're not thinking so well. Maybe we're thinking, oh, maybe this is just, you know, I'm having a bad day, so we avoid it. And then sleep problems. A study was done just towards the end of last year that showed that most people in the pandemic were affected by sleep by having an average of about 30 minutes less sleep a night. These same things are felt by someone who maybe has been affected with losing their job and losing what's been going on with their life, uh, struggling to pay rent, uh, a lot of these things. So we are affected whether we're essential workers or whatnot. None of us really knew what to, was going on with this, but these are things that happen. And what happens is, in the pandemic, our brain, when we're experiencing this, that stressor doesn't know when to go back to the brain to tell us that that's over. So what can we do about this, right? What we can do about this is maybe try to get into some self-care. When we get into self-care, we're often resilient. And resiliency means that what we have done when we're resilient is we have worked on uh, something that really we had to get over this problem, some obstacle was difficult to overcome, but we did it. And how we did it, it might mean that we actually asked for a lot of help or we utilized a lot of self-care and taking care of ourselves to get this done. I know I rely on a lot of self-care to try and help me get through the basic day-to-day -day problems that I have. So what, when we're focusing on self-care, what I want you to know is that self-care means something different for anyone. All right. It's a way that we learn how to use our coping skills. All right. And we have to practice on how to do this. Just remember what I said before. It's okay to feel how you feel. Every one of us in mental health, right? We're not always 100%. Some days we may be only 70 or 80%. But what we do for self care to take care of ourselves how actually helps us to be able to do trainings like this to help you take care of yourself. So when you get up in the morning, plan ahead. Think what's gonna go on in your day. Maybe think of something that's gonna be good that's gonna go on. And take care of your physical needs, right? Eat healthy, take breaks when you need. Get up from that computer, go on outside, take a breath of fresh air, right? What we have to remember is to connect to our social care system. These are things we need to do. Connection is so important. We need to connect to that group, that person, that one thing in our life that makes us you know, feeling better. Maybe um, calling your husband or your wife, or your aunt, your uncle, grandma, grandpa, whoever it is, the next door neighbor. And just remember, whatever you're doing, that's your best and that's good enough. We can't do more than what we can do. Sometimes that is just has to be enough. Okay, practicing self-love. This is one thing that I'm a big proponent of. Uh, people and those of us that really care about ourselves and have self-love within us, love ourselves for just who we are, right? That's one of the greatest gifts in the world. This picture is actually from our Instagram account. Uh, we're on Instagram under live now. And live in the now, the and then now is Hawaiian for your gut. Live by your gut, your feelings. We often post really good mental health messages on how to take care of ourselves, or refresh ourselves. Uh, you know, when we're in Instagram. So if you're in Instagram and see us, maybe you can follow us. You know, I think some of our daily messages can help you uh, keep refilling your cup right? Because we can't pour from an empty cup. We have to keep filling our cup in order to help others, no matter who we are. Just remember, you can't pour from an empty cup. All right, let's get into self-care. 
Self-care is one of the most wonderful things in the world. It's gonna help you cope with life on a daily basis. I want you to validate your emotions. I want you to know that however you feel is how you feel. Uh, Dr. Uh, Matsisa Goss, um, who I'm stepping in for today, she developed this uh, training. And one of the things Dr. G, as we like to call her, uh, explains is that when you're thinking of self-care, when you're doing good self-care, it's like you're making deposits in a bank savings account. You're investing in your good self-care on a daily basis. So when you need to take out some of that on a day that maybe you're not doing so well emotionally on a bad day, you have built up some good self-care to help you do this. So when you validate your emotions, you're saying it's okay. I'm feeling the way I'm feeling this today, right? Sometimes we just don't feel 100% and that's just to have to be the best. But we're staying connected. We're again, again, this connectedness, we're reaching out. We're talking to our coworkers. You know, we're talking to our husbands, our wives. We're staying present for what's going on. Um, when the pandemic first started, many of us were checking on the news constantly. What I want you to remind you to help avoid anxiety and stress is don't overcheck. Don't try to see what's happening 24 seven, all right? I know some people that have to keep watching the news. My suggestion is find some news channel or find some information that you like maybe in the morning and the evening, but limit it to a little bit a day. People that tend to overcheck keep seeing things that are gonna build on their stress. Check in on the essential workers, check in on the people that you work with. Maybe who's vulnerable in your circle. You know, maybe someone you know that gets affected differently by certain things that happen or more sensitive than others. You know, reach out, see how they're doing. People like that. And creature comforts, of course, we have our little puppy here, right? We all know the beauty and the effect that dogs and cats and our neighbors, you know, our animals, maybe a little pig that we might have, right? When we have our creature comforts, you know, animals, they have been shown to calm our nervous system down. They can decrease our anxiety. They love us unconditionally. Many consider them a family member, right? There's such healing power in the animal bond. I can't speak enough of it. Um, my cat, when I go home, you know, is right there, will come up, you know, give a little purr, come up to me. Sometimes she's, you know, not paying attention, but loves to cuddle up a lot of times. Excuse me. Okay, so some other ways of self-care. Follow a schedule. When you get up in the morning, think about what you're going to do in the daytime. All right, think about times when you can maybe insert some self-care into that day. What can you do? Schedule it in. I know sometimes on a super stressful day, if I'm in the office, I'll work through my lunch, I'll have my lunch, and then what I'll do is I'll turn out all the lights in my office, I'll put on a 20 minute guided meditation, I'll take some deep breaths and I'll just chill out, right? I schedule in self-care for the day. Maybe it's a walk around the complex. Um, use social media responsibly. And what I mean is check all the stories that you're doing. Identify online resources. Don't just share something because it looks like it's good information to share. If you don't know who it's from, don't share it. Be responsible. Right. And then above all, invest in yourself. That's what self-care is. Self-care is a complete investment in who you are. Right. And get out and spend some time in nature. Go for a walk. Go down to the beach. Watch the sunrise. Watch the sunset. Get out in the woods and take a hike. Right. Get in the water. Right. Get out in nature. These are things that are going to help us deal better with our stress and our anxiety. So there's also warning signs that we can tell if we're getting too stressed out or if we're getting too anxious, all right? And how do we know when it's being impacted more, right? These are some things that might give you the clue that maybe this has been impacting you a little bit. If your mood deregulation for two weeks or longer, you're not quite yourself, maybe you've been feeling a little bit down, but you feel off, that's a warning sign, anhedonia, and what anhedonia is, is the inability to feel pleasure, all right? Maybe people, maybe, um, you know, you used to like to be social or you like to hug people or, you know, certain foods you like to eat make you feel good. All of a sudden, you're not feeling those anymore. So it's really the inability when you have anhedonia to feel pleasure. 
keep an eye out for this. A lot of times it is related to depression, but you don't have to be depressed to have it. Um, express suicidality. And this just could be things have been tough and you know, you might have said out loud, maybe I'd be better off if I wasn't here anymore. Any kind of sayings like that, any kind of suicidal ideation is a warning sign that you need to take a look at yourself. And if you see it in somebody else, that's a time maybe to reach out and have a talk with them and see how they're doing. Um, if there's a negative impact on your work or at school, if you're feeling socially withdrawn, if you're starting to isolate from people, if you're drifting away from that connection, if your daily activities are being interrupted, and if your relationships are being interrupted. Any one of these things can be a cause to look at and anything in combination are ways to really give you some warning signs to think about maybe I might need to reach out for someone for help. And what I like to think is an easy way to remember this. If these things, anything at all is affecting your ability to live laugh, love, or learn, all right, then that might be a little trigger and a warning sign for you to maybe do something about it. Um, we're going to talk for a minute about grief, and all of us grieve in our own way, and this is a picture again from our Live Now account, right? We have all been affected by grief in many different ways, and uh, it's usually basically the cause of a loss, and it might be a loss of a loved one, Maybe we have lost friends um, during this pandemic. Uh, but grief is also personal, but it's also community-wise. As a community, we've lost a lot. We've lost the ability to get together. We've lost the ability to be able to go out and hug somebody. Um, we may have lost a job, some of us, or we may have lost um, a family member. Uh, maybe you lost your home. Uh, all of us have experienced grief in some way, some kind of loss. I know I've, you know, stayed with the pandemic and we worked really hard during the last year. And I had already planned in the beginning of 2020, I was going to see my family in New York at Christmas. I lost that trip, right? When we're experiencing grief, when we're going through grief, just, you know, it's difficult. And it is. It's And try to be patient with yourself. All right. Try to be patient. Validate how you feel. You know, all of us are adjusting to everything as we go along on a day to day basis and always, always, you know, reach out for help. I know that um, that there's grief groups that are available uh, on the island. I believe hospice has one. I think they're meeting online now. I know there's also the National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI. They have groups as well. So uh, help is out there. But just remember, healing from a loss takes time. Other ways to see if we're being affected by the warning signs, these are just ways to check in, all right? These are ways you can check in on yourself or others. Ask yourself, how am I doing today? How am I feeling? You know, am I doing all right? I was struggling in the last couple of days. Do I feel better today? What are my relationships like? Am I staying in touch? Have I called my auntie? Gosh, I haven't called my auntie in so long. I should reach out to her. She probably is worried about me. I'm worried about her. How's your work going? right? Are you getting through it? Are you doing okay? Um, are you getting enough sleep? And I know sleep is a big challenge for many of us. I mentioned it earlier, but if you're not getting enough sleep, there's certain things you can try and do with that. You know, go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time. Uh, there's lots of different tools and we'll give you uh, some tools towards the end. This is one of them that we'll talk about. But if we're not getting enough sleep, that's something to maybe have cause about. Again, that connection. Are we staying connected? Are we still within our connective groups? Are we still helping others or reaching out for help? Do you feel hopeful? And I know a lot of times people have felt like there is no hope, that this is never going to end. One of the things that I adhere to, especially all during this pandemic and something that I've known my whole life is something that I learned a long time ago that my grandmother had told me. And she said, Danielle, it doesn't matter what happens in life this too shall pass, right? Nothing lasts forever. So that is one of the things that I use to hold on to hope, right? There's always something happening, right? It seems like our federal government is getting a little more involved in wanting to give us aid again, all right? Um, just keep looking in and checking in with yourself to see how you're doing, right? This is so, so important. And all these self-care 
things that I've talked about are ways to help you get through the day-to-day -day life when stress and anxiety are starting to build up. So now we're going to go back into maybe switching gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about our self-care, but what about coping skills? So coping skills are a little bit different. Self-care is really, really good on a daily basis, but every once in a while, we need to utilize some coping skills, which are going to be able to help us in a situation where we really need to get more help and we needed to get it fast. So this is the Likert scale of responding. And the Likert scale of responding, <clears throat> excuse me one second. The Likert scale of responding was set up uh, by a gentleman named Rensis Likas. He was uh, back in 1932, he was a psychologist, right? And what he did was put together a scale um, based on how people react in different situations and on a scale of you know, less severe, more severe, and very severe. So how we're wording it today is we're going to utilize our coping skills during this time. So when you see your zero to 40, right, you're in a pretty good area. Your self-care is pretty effective, right? You might need no help to address any symptoms of anxiety, your diet, your exercise, your self-care is doing pretty good. But as we get up a little bit, towards 40 and start to get into the 40 to 60 range, we're feeling some symptoms of anxieties. And maybe those coping skills or maybe those self-care skills are, have been working, but now they're not working so well. So now we need some coping skills to help us. And then there are those times at 60 to 100 when you have a high le level of anxiety. And that's where the use of coping skills um, are not as effective and that's when we use distress tolerance skills. And we're gonna get into explaining all these. Excuse me, when I talk a lot, <coughs> my throat gets dry. All right, so what I wanna talk about first is a coping skill is mindfulness, okay? Mindfulness helps you stay present. It is being present focused. You're staying right here, right now. You're not in the future thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. You're not in the past thinking about what happened yesterday. You're just present. You're here today. One of the ways to do this is called radical acceptance. And radical acceptance can be broken down to something as simply saying, it is what it is, right? It may not like the sound of that, but you know, it just is what it is. Whatever's gone on has happened it. And so I also want to compare this. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the serenity prayer, right? It's really a good correlation to this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? If I could change the pandemic today from stopping, I would, believe me right? Because I'm tired of it like anyone else is. But I don't have the power to change that, right? I can't do that, right? What can I change? What are the things in my life I can change? Well, I can't change what's going on around me. But what I can do is I can change the way I react to it, right? I have the power to do that. I have the power to change and how I react to other people and how I view other people, on how, whether I accept them or not. I have that ability. There's certain things that we can change. I can change things about myself. I can become better focused on self-care and taking care of myself, but I can't change you. I can't change you into something that I want you to see. These are things with radical acceptance that really do help you stay present focused and in the moment. Meditation and prayer is a great combination. Um, it's usually accessed by practice. Um, I'm a big fan of meditation and prayer. I do it often in the morning on my morning walks. Um, I want you to be and think about it during this time when you're doing good self-care, when you're really being mindful, you're being accessible to people, right? You're staying responsive. You're being engaged with yourself, with your coworkers. And then being a good listener, right? Be a good listener to people. Right, you get someone to open up to you maybe about a situation or a problem and then they come back to you in a couple of weeks 
and uh, you know, they see that you, know, you want to talk to you about it again and you forgot what they talked about. Be a good listener. Don't pick up that phone and like, you know, I'm listening to you. Nobody wants to see that, right? And then also what I want to focus on, Leslie, is single task rather than multitask. A lot of us say we're great multitaskers, but I want you to think of this. Sometimes we just need to single task on some things. If we're only 60 or 70% in one day, concentrate on what you can do best, right? Be mindful, right? Just know that some days those stressors are gonna be a little more focused than others. Just try to stay focused on the basics. All right, let's get into some more coping skills here, right? So we talked about mindfulness, okay? Being mindful, being present, and the, how the use of mindfulness is, could be with meditation. Uh, meditation is a great, great tool. Um, it works across all levels. Uh, deep breathing is really good. Deep breathing actually correlates a lot with meditation as well as progressive muscle uh, relaxation. And how that works is a lot of times when you meditate, you often do a lot of deep breathing, you know, to kind of slow yourself down a little bit. When you breathe deeply, it changes inside your system. You're bringing in more oxygen, letting out the carbon dioxide. It lowers your stress. It slows your heart rate. And then you might do some progressive muscle relaxation when you're doing that. And that's basically just kind of relaxing your muscles all the way through the body. And normally it goes from your feet up to your head, but um, I'm looking at the time here. I have a little bit, we can do it quickly, just do one or two of them. So in progressive muscle act relaxation, you've been tensing and then releasing pressure on your muscles all the way through your body. So what it might look like when it gets to your head, so you, cause you can see my face. So if you like scrunch your eyebrows in like that and count to like six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then relax it by taking a breath out, you feel that whole area relaxes the same way by going through different parts of your, your body, like your jaw, your chest, right? Going all the way down by breathing deeply after you've done it and relaxing, you see your whole body starts to relax. Um, uh, autogenic training, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Autogenic training is a technique that teaches your body to respond to verbal commands. And this is like uh, you tell your body to relax or maybe to control your breathing or your blood pressure and your heartbeat and everything just starts to go down. Your body temperature goes down. So an example of autogenic training, right, is to do deep relaxation to reduce your stress. But let me give you another example here is um, just take your arms out in front of you if you're sitting down or whatever you're doing. And um, uh, I'm gonna give you, we're gonna do a little of it right here. So uh, for example, if I was to say, you know, how heavy is your shirt, right? You're, you're thinking, well, my brain doesn't really react to that, Danielle, because it really doesn't weigh much yet. And then Brian, your brain doesn't consider that information that they really need to pay attention to or how tight are your socks? Right, you probably haven't thought about that except maybe now, maybe you're thinking maybe my socks are a little tight. But let's do a little bit of this autogenic training with our arm. So what I want you to do is put your arm out in front of you, like you can see mine is right here. And I want you to just listen to me. And I'm gonna tell you just as we go along, your arm is heavy and warm. Your arm is heavy and warm. Your arm is heavy and warm. Now, even when I do this myself, I can feel it. And I hope that you you can see what I'm saying to you. Your arm is starting to feel heavy and it does feel a little bit warmer. And when we do this autogenic training, it's the same as that we talked about when we're coming back down from flight, fight or freeze, right? It's lowering our heart rate, it's lowering our blood pressure. And these are things that will calm us down. Another thing to do in relaxation for coping skills might be grounding. Going out into the yard, taking off your shoes and socks or your slippers and just dig your toes into the grass. Do some deep breathing really slowly, 
right? And then aromatherapy is also something that people like to do, uh, but be careful when you're doing it because you know there's some aromas and everything that are a little more intense than others. Um, and so I want you to know that I would go with a company that you know uh, that you know something about that knows a lot about the different kinds of aromas and, and essential oils that you might be able to use. Some essential oils are too much to use on their own. So be careful with that. But these are all ways to be helping you with um, your coping skills. So we talked a little bit about diaphragmic breathing and I wanna give a demonstration of us now and we're all gonna be able to do it. And we're gonna find out as we do this diaphragmic breathing, again, we're letting in the good oxygen and we're slowly gonna be letting out the carbon dioxide. Maybe if you've been feeling stressed, you have some of that cortisol that's been going through your, your veins. What happens is the oxygenation of your body are gonna slow your heartbeat down and it's gonna help it. So I want you to do is I want you to put um, your right hand on your chest and then I'll have to stand up for this. And I want you to put your left hand at the top here, just at the top of your stomach, right about on your diaphragm. Right, right about where it touches your, a little bit above your uh, belly button, all right? So what we're gonna do is with diaphragmic breathing, right? We're gonna breathe from our diaphragm. So when we take a deep breath, all right? I want you to breathe in slowly through your nose and your chest. And I want that lower belly to help fill your lungs and not push your chest out so much, but use that belly. And then we're gonna let it out slowly. So we're gonna do it on a count of four. So everybody take a deep breath in from your diaphragm. One, two, three, four. Hold it, hold it. Slowly let it out. Four, three, two, one. Let's do it again. Take a deep breath in. One, two, three, four. And let it out slowly. Four, three, two, one. One more time. Take it in. One, two, three, four. And let it back out. Four, three, two, one. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty good. When we breathe that way, we're bringing that oxygen into our body. We are oxygenating our brain and our body and our heart. And what's that do? You feel more calm, right? Your blood pressure starts to lower and go down. These are all good coping skills that you can do if you're feeling that stress and anxiety where it talked about in the Likert scale, closer to 60 or maybe getting into that other zone. Try to find a place to just relax and do some deep breathing if you have the time to do some of the other things, right? I'm talking about the meditation or whatever, incorporate those. But what we're also gonna find out is that there's sometimes, right, when we just get closer to that 60 level. And that's when we need to use some distress tolerance skills. And I like to think of these as Dr. G says to us, that these are kind of like trap doors. Right? These are ways that you're going to experience and use your distress tolerance skills to really lower your blood pressure and your heartbeat really quickly because you have been very, very stressed. Right? These were created by Marsha Linhan. Distress tolerance skills are the type of, inter are the type of intervention where clients used to manage stress in a very helpful way. These are for helpful for situations where you feel you have no more control over what's going on, all right? And they help, they're gonna be used to help you manage your own response, right? So something that we talked about with, um, you know, that serenity prayer, knowing what you can and cannot do, utilize these distress tolerance skills as a way to think about that quick trap door to slow down. So some of these um, you may recognize already. Like we all know that intense exercise, when you exercise a lot, when you're doing a run or when you're on your bike or whatever it is, you're on a fast paced walk, you know, for an hour or so, 
right? Your whole body's breathing and everything, you know, I'm so stressed, I just need to get out. I'm gonna go for a swim, I'm gonna do whatever. What happens is, as you start working out, your muscles start to relax, everything in your body starts to relax. Those endorphins start to flow through your body, those feel good endorphins, everything in your body starts to come down. Oftentimes we don't have an hour to be able to do these things, right? Paced breathing, something that very similar to the diaphragmic breathing I just uh, showed you. When we breathe, an average time is like 12 to 14 times a minute, we take a breath, all right? But what happens in paced breathing, uh, we might take uh, five to seven breaths a minute. We just might pace it down, similar to what we did in the diaphragmic breathing. Sometimes this might not work if you really need to just escape quickly and have that trap door. There's also something called the dive response. Now the dive response is actually something that any mammal can do. Think about our marine mammals that they're out there, the turtles in the ocean, our whales, you know, on land, you know, I think we have our beavers, anyone that can spend time underwater for a certain amount of time, even like black pearl divers, right? They go down, they can spend like, you know, seven, eight minutes underwater and then come back up and be okay. So when you are in the dive response, what happens is when you totally immerse yourself in water, uh, the water is a stimulation of some nerves in the upper part of your nose. And I believe they're called the trigeminal nose, and I might pronounce that wrong, trigeminal nerves. Um, and when that happens, right, when you go underwater, basically you're holding your breath, but your heart starts to slow down, right? The same thing might be happening when you're in that flight mode. All that blood, all that oxygen in the blood starts to go back towards your brain and towards your heart, right? Everything is starting to slow down. Now we do have the ocean here that we're surrounded by one and we can maybe after work go jump in it, but you might not have an ocean right next to you. Maybe you need to do this right away. You can actually activate this if you put your head in water, like in a bowl of water, fill a sink in water and just stick your head in there and hold it down underneath there for more than 10 seconds. That is what starts to trigger that. Now, if you just splash water on yourself, it's not gonna trigger the dive response. Um, you know, putting a cold complex with compress on your neck or whatever lowers your uh, temperature in your body, but that might not be enough. So here's a, here's a way to do it. If you can take like a towel or, uh, you know, something that you have, uh, maybe a clean rag or something that you can soak in water and you can put it actually over your nose and your mouth and hold it there and just start breathing in deeply with the deep breaths, okay? Breathing through it with your nose, all right? That's gonna actually trigger the dive response. And believe me, when that dive response happens, everything in your body just slowly starts to you know, come down pretty, and not slowly, but actually comes down pretty quickly. The longer that you do it, everything starts to just relax. And this is a great trap door to use if you just really need to uh, get out of it. There's also um, paired muscle relaxation. Uh, and that's very similar to what we just did uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, but it's it has that sensation of tightness in one area and then releasing that tightness for five or six seconds. So like maybe taking your arm in your hand and squeezing it for about six seconds and then letting it go and just say, relax. By doing that, you start to really feel much more uh, relaxed. These are all just good trap doors that we can use to help us slow down. Okay, we've talked about our coping skills, we've talked about our self-care. What's our support plan, right? What is it in your support plan? What is it that gives you meaning or what is it that gives you hope, right? How do you take care of yourself, right? What is it that you can do to make you feel better, right? Is there someone you can talk to or um, who do you think, what can you do to maybe lower your stress, all right? Um, if you need that support, who is it you can call? And we're gonna give you some numbers here to call in a second. But do you have those numbers in your phone? Maybe someone you can reach out to right away. And it could be maybe someone who's a professional like a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or maybe someone you might just already be seeing. 
or maybe it's the Hawaii Cares line or something. Uh, you could have that on your phone. Maybe it's your pastor of your church. A lot of times they're very responsive in helping and talk to it. So we'll, again, after the training, we're going to send you a copy of the of the training itself in uh, in uh, PDF and then also a list of crisis. But I also want you to think about supporting yourself. What is it in your life that gives you meaning? What is it that causes and gives you hope? What is it that makes you feel better, right? Doing something for yourself, doing something of self-care is just so, so important of taking care of yourself. What is it that you want to do? In the chat here, I want you to just pop in. What can you do this weekend to take care of yourself? What do you want to do that's going to help support to help make you feel better? What's some kind of self-care that you want to do over the weekend? Something that you might be looking forward to. I know myself, one of my big support plans is I like to take naps. I like to slow down and take a nap, but if you feel like it, pop it in the chat. We have a minute or two here before we get to questions. Anyone? Yeah, me too. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Lay. Yeah, naps are good. Gardening. Yes, Jerry, I'm going to be out my gardening too. That's good. Those are all good ways to take care of ourselves. All right. Always good to have that support plan, no matter what it is. Take the dogs out. Read a good book. Yeah, Jocelyn. Get in the ocean. Yes, Rebecca. All good. All good ways. Okay, so these are some of the resources that you'll be receiving the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's 1 800 7 or 1 800 273 8255. They also have links on there to, uh, for our uh, veterans uh, as well. There's also the Hawaii Cares Line, which used to be the Crisis Line of Hawaii. That's 1 800 753 6879. That's been expanded. And thank you, Jerry, for putting in military one source into the chat. That's also been expanded Hawaii Cares to be able to help take care of, uh, of not your just your mental health, your mental wellness, um, but you can reach out and maybe get some counseling, get links to that. Uh, sometimes you can go with the crisis text line as well. That's uh, texting Aloha 753-753. Uh, sometimes you feel more like texting and then talking. Um, other way of things that we could do how to protect and respect our keiki, right? There's Department of Human Services. Uh, we all know that child abuse, some of that was a little more dangerous during the pandemic. Um, uh, you know, so I see Tom, you're having stress and anxiety, haven't slept for about two, three, four hours in the last day. We're going to get to something that might be able to help you in just a second. Um, Child Trafficking Report Hotline, uh, that's on Oahu, 800 808 832 1999. Of course, you're going to get these slides. And then, not how every home is safe, uh, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Uh, and then, a Maui, I think we also have, I think I have it here. Uh, I put it in my notes. Um, Women Helping Women Maui is uh, 800 579. 9581 I'm going to just pop it into the chat here as well as I'm going along. That's a local one for uh, domestic violence, and they actually do help uh, men as well as women. So let me pop that in here right now. There you go. Um, so, Tom, you're saying you're having some problems with uh, sleep. There's a CBTI coach. We're going to go to that one first. And uh, this is a free app. Um, it was developed to help people experiencing symptoms of insomnia um, who would like to improve their sleep. Uh, I think it was developed in, in uh, conjunction with the Veterans Administration. Again, it is a free app that you can use and download. Uh, the, the, some of the people that I've talked to that have utilized this um, found it really helps. Uh, uh, you know, there's lots of good things on there. There's also COVID Coach, um, which is another free app. And this has just helped you with your self-care and your mental health during the pandemic. Uh, there's an app if you have Kaiser 
insurance. It's called Calm and it's free. If you have Kaiser, you can download it. But these are some things to be able to help you with your sleep and uh, seeing what you can do to try and release that anxiety and depression for a little bit. And I think too, if you can start to inject some of these self-care ideas that we had uh, into your life on a daily basis, you'll slowly start to see a change there. So I hope that some of these will help. Um, and then lastly, we have our uh, new Get Connected page on our uh, website. Uh, we started this right at the beginning of the pandemic. We have all kinds of resources there for you to link up to uh, some free counseling if you need be or resources just on general on the pandemic and numbers to call. We have lists of our trainings there as well. Uh, and a daily basis, uh, we can links to telepsych, uh, social media, printout materials that we have. Uh, in creating healthy routines. Um, we have stuff for the Kiki as far as other printable materials like bookmarks or we created a busy bee page and we have book clubs for adults. We have also book clubs for our uh, youth. And uh, Jerry, thank you. She dropped that into the chat. I appreciate it. So as we're getting towards the end here, um, I think just one more slide to go. This is our contact information, uh, our Wahoo office, our Maui office. Um, my number here is 808-242-6461. Um, so that is our presentation for today. I think we just have a minute or two, maybe five minutes left. Um, I'm glad to take any other questions in the chat that you might have or anything that I might be able to help you with. And if I can't help you with it, maybe we can find uh, an answer that I could, you know, contact you later with. But as I said, again, we will get these all out to you um, in a PDF as well as our resources. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it. Um, good. I'm glad you're going to be able to interject some of those techniques as we discussed. Anyone else? Okay, well, I hope that what some of I said today is going to help you. You know, self care is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And try to remember some of these coping skills to when it really gets bad. Um, I, I know that stress and anxiety can be, you know, very challenging. And uh, it really has been, you know, a go for all of us. You know, it doesn't matter the condition of your uh, mental wellness. Uh, you know, really, if you do some of these on a daily basis, I think what you're going to find is that um, you're going to really uh, be able to start to feel better in your life. And I think I just saw one person uh, lay. Okay, so you missed most of it. Um, we'll have our next ones. We're actually uh, getting our schedule together for March. So uh, link into our Get Connected page, or if you do want to, um, contact us, we can add your name to our distribution email list and we'll go from there. So thank you, Leigh. I'm so glad that you were able to make it. If there's no other questions from anyone, I'm gonna let you guys go, maybe get some lunch or if you haven't finished your lunch, you can get, oh yes, and thank you, Michelle. Um, really appreciate that, yes. Kum, Kum, uh, Kumakani is a new resource that actually is through the, um, I believe it, you can resource it through Hawaii Cares. And the Kumakani project is actually funded from uh, the Hawaii Cares Act, uh, the, the National Cares Act, but it's Cares Act funding that is anyone who has been affected by uh, the pandemic, right? Or have been affected uh, through any kind of mental health, you can get some free counseling through there. Michelle did just drop that number uh, in there, I believe, and that is maybe the Oahu number, but you can also access with the other number, 800-753-6879. Uh, thank you both to uh, Michelle and to Jerry, who's uh, my support on here. So I just wanna wish you a really good, happy Aloha Friday. And I hope that uh, you have a great rest of your day and that you do something nice for yourself this weekend. You know why? Because you deserve it. So Aloha. <laughs>